Good evening. evening. Welcome to our time of worship at Sanborn Christian Reformed Church. Thank you, Avery, for uh, helping us. Uh, It's a great way to set our mood and and prepare our hearts to do what we're called to do here, um, to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to spend some time singing together. We're going to spend some time praying together. And I will take some prayer requests. So if you have some things in mind, um, you could be thinking about how you want to share those uh, when that time comes. And we are uh, in God's Word in the Psalms, using the Psalms to think about how we pray to our Lord using the words He's given us in various situations and circumstances in life. And so we're thinking about praying when we're, uh, our hearts are filled with fears and we're bringing those before our God um, with Psalm 55. So um, hope, uh, I hope uh, you are blessed um, in our time of worship together. And we're going to begin our service with Psalm 46, the first seven verses. I'm reminding our, which reminds us of of God, our, our strength in times of various troubles. So hear God's word. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mouth, mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Take the first and last phrase we just thought about. God is our refuge and strength. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let that saturate your minds as we spend some time in silent prayer. I invite you to rise and hear God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to join our voices together in song, and the first song we're going to sing is O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, the first four verses. Master, let me walk with thee. We're going to uh, sing all the verses of O Master, let me walk with thee.
Third song we're going to sing is Guide Thee, O My Great Redeemer. I think we've probably heard a theme in this is about how God guides us even in a difficult and, and fearsome times. We're going to sing all the verses of this as well. to spend some time um, lifting up our, each other's praises and our, our sorrows, our, our petitions and our joys before the Lord. I just want to um, share a couple things. We, we shared last week of uh, grandsons of John and Sue, our neighbors, Brandon Hengeveld, I think that's how you pronounce their last name. Um, Brandon uh, is dealing with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. I haven't talked to them yet. I haven't seen them around um, recently, but let's continue to pray for, for that family and their grandson. Also, we have 24 people planning to attend a service trip at F Street this summer, so that's a praise. And uh, I know I got a text message from um, the person planning, planning that, and uh, our uh, stuff is all in, and so we're excited about that too. So we're going to mention those Two things in our prayer is what I have written so far. What, what would you like to add to our prayers this evening? Anybody? Yes, Judy. I could love the Lord, but we have 25. Now. 25. Yes. Yes. Yes, Larry. Uh, be thankful for the warm homes that we have in this cold time. Absolutely. Warm places to go when it's very cold outside. Anybody else? Short list tonight, that's fine. Um, we will uh, mention these and I'll bring some th other things that we have in our bulletin before God in prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Lord God, we do thank you for bringing us together in this place, for giving us songs to sing, but more importantly to those songs point us towards the gospel of Jesus Christ, our great redeemer, and the one who has saved us, the one who has delivered us from the spiritual bondage we are in, the one who has forgiven us 
of the shortcomings and sins, the way we have missed the mark and fallen short of your glory, the gospel that reminds us we're adopted as children into a new family, the gospel that reminds us, Lord, that you have a future inheritance for us in heaven that nothing can threaten. So we praise you tonight for the reasons we are together, because we need to be reminded of them ourselves, and we need to remind each other of the good news that you have, of what you have accomplished for us, so we are built up in our faith and encouraged in the week ahead. Lord, some of us are looking ahead to what the next few days with optimism and enthusiasm. There's things that are good that we have planned. Some of us have things we're dreading in the next few days, and we bring whatever our hearts are carrying to you, into your presence, asking, Lord, that you would provide what we need, both by bo with, in body and in soul, in opportunities, and in the way we approach those opportunities, um, to, Lord, serve you in all that we do. We pray that you would bid our anxious fear subside, as we just sang about, um, in our world that is distraught and conflict, conflicted with political discourse and rhetoric. We're concerned by some things that are going on in our nation. We, Lord, lament when leaders are not true to what they say is not what they are doing. And, and we're just, we pray, Lord, for our leaders, those that are um, representing us and governing our state and our nation. We pray for wisdom. We pray for clarity of, of thought. We pray for those that lead on our behalf to have a listening ear and have to navigate so many different voices that are coming at them, as we do too in each and every day of our lives. We pray that we would honor those who are in authority, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be citizens that are not simply citizens of this earthly place, this civil realm that we call the United States, that we would be citizens of, of the kingdom of God and sense our unity with Christians around the world, some who are praising you and rejoicing in, in mass numbers, lifting up their praises, being heard by the world around them, some worshiping in secret, being threatened, threatened by the very civil leaders you've ordained to be there. And so we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for their steadfastness and their courage and their faith amidst their fears. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen them and increase their numbers and increase their faith and teach us uh, lessons about how we can stand strong and true in the midst of opposition. Lord God, we thank you for the warmth of our homes, our churches, our buildings, our places of work in this cold season. We thank you, Lord, for shelter, for, for those that are skilled in, in the craft of building and those that are doing service calls for keeping people's um, plumbing going and heating on this time of year. We thank you, Lord, that you provide a means of, of staying warm. And we thank you, Lord, that you um, give us this place tonight to worship you together. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you'd be with those that are looking to you for their help in special times of need. Um, we, we thank you once again that you have given uh, Don Eitenbogard um, recovery and, and healing. We pray for him as he has treatments each and every day. In Sheldon, we pray that that would be effective and that you would give him full restoration of health. We ask, Lord, that Erin Olson would continue to recover well at home and that she would be back um, to herself soon. And we ask that you would bless her and her family as they're taking it easy and letting her get back to healthy and normal. We ask, uh, Lord, once again that you would be with Robert Vavra as he is undergoing treatments for brain cancer, and we pray that you would be with Doc Man Warren, who is uh, thinking he is near the end of his earthly life, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. That's part of a, the challenge that he is dealing with. We pray for peace. We pray that he would place his faith in you 
and be confident in your promises at this time of his life. We pray that you would be with uh, young Nate Veningen. We thank you that the bumps that they found, the bump they found on his neck was not cancerous, and we pray that you'd give him a recovery since he had some lymph nodes removed, and we ask, um, Lord, that you would also be with Judy Carpenter being treated for cancer on her esophagus. We lift up also, Lord, um, Brandon Hengeveld, a grandson of our neighbors. We pray for him as he has been recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. We know this is a dreadful condition, a disease. We pray with him and his family that you would see him through this and that may your will be that you bring about healing at work in his life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to serve in our own communities. We thank you for an opportunity to, to gather together as, as a church community and serve others. And we, we're, in, we're excited about this opportunity to go down to Lincoln, Nebraska with F Street Church there and serve alongside them and, and learn and grow together and, and grow in our affection and appreciation for, for the act of service. Lord, we have been so blessed with years and years of, of trips down to Cary, Mississippi, and we, we stopped that with some grieving in our hearts. And now you've provided this opportunity. And so we thank you, and we pray that you would bless the 25 people signed up to go on this trip. We pray that you would bless them as they're preparing and thinking about the the best ways they could use our gifts, and we just ask that you would um, be with them. We ask a blessing on the offering we receive now. We ask that you would use these resources um, that we dedicate to you to bring glory to your name, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I forgot to note uh, during announcements, there is one um, Typo, the offering is for our Benevolence Fund, not for Immerse Serve tonight. We will be taking an offering for that cause later, but we are going to take an offering now for our Benevolence Fund.
We're going to learn a new song before we open God's Word together. Um, it's, I will hide your word inside my heart. It's number 761 in this new red hymnal, which is up here. I agree to uh, sing it through once, and then uh, it's a very short song, and then we can all join together singing it. There's two verses, and so let's stand. I will sing it through once, and then we will all sing together. Um, I will hide your word inside my heart. I will hide your word inside my heart so that it may guide me like a shining light let it burn so bright I will follow you I will hide We are going to open our scriptures together to Psalm 55. Psalm 55, uh, if you're using a Bible in the pew in front of you, most of those have that on page 498. Listen to my prayer, O oh God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and, and revile, revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Confuse the wicked, O oh Lord. Confound their speech. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls, malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave the streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. Let death, let, let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the grave, for evil finds lodging among them. But I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them, men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. 
He will never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. As for me, I trust in you. This is God's word for us tonight, and may the Lord bless our meditation upon it. We are going to um, start with this question, a very basic question. Um, what are we afraid of? And uh, we can have some congregational participation here. What are we afraid of? Anybody have something? What are we afraid of? Bats. Really? I haven't there hasn't been any in here for a while, but at home? Okay. Afraid of bats. Had the first thing that came to my mind. That's why I, I do this. So what are we afraid of? Downturn in the economy. Inflation, snakes, I heard. There's an animal theme going on here. I guess when it gets cold outside, all these critters come in, right? Um, maybe it's not. Maybe you say, well, I know a guy who's afraid of, you know, maybe that's how you want to say it tonight. What are we, what are we afraid of? In general. Pandemics. Pandemics. That's right. Things we can't control. People that are dishonest and then have power. Anybody else? What are we afraid of? The future is for my grandkids. The future for your grandkids. What world are we what what world are we investing in now and how is that gonna reap benefits and non and opposite of benefits and challenges for our future generations. Yep. Anything else? Anything else we're afraid of you want to throw out there? Well, these are all things that I, I hope we have learned to say, well, we're going to put our fears into prayers, right? We're going to take these things that bother us, whether they're bats or pandemics, and say, God, help me with this fear. I'm going to lay it at your feet. I'm going to cast my cares upon you, as we just read, and, and let, you, let you help me with this fear. I mean, fear is very paralyzing, right? Very often we, we say we make terrible mistakes when we're miserably afraid. If we are trying to get a bat out of our house and we're scared to death to do it, we, our chances of success are pretty low, right? We're, we're going to be like, you know, it's just not going to work. We've, we need someone that has some confidence that's just going to get a blanket and throw it over that thing and catch that thing and get it, get it out of there. Um, I think the same thing goes with, with all dimensions of life. The things that, when we're just scared stiff of what we're dealing with in life, we're, we're often can't see straight, we can't think straight, we can't act the way we need to to address our fears. And so uh, I... I thought about this, this question a lot this week as I saw that we were going to pray about our fears. What are we afraid of? This, I must admit and, and just be clear, is, is one of my pastoral weaknesses. I don't find myself very afraid of very many things. And then so when someone comes into my office and is scared to death of something like bats or snakes. By the way, I had a bunch of snakes in aquariums growing up. I kept them as pets. I thought they were really cool. Um, I, I just have a hard time relating sometimes. I have to put myself in, in their place and imagine myself if I were afraid of these things and, and try to listen and understand. But just by default, I just don't find there's many things I'm immediately afraid of. And so I have to relate it to things. Okay, well, what, what bother me? What, what, what get me um, kind of paralyzed and, and clammed up? in the face of things and fears. And so I, th I thought of, uh, I thought back to um, Michelle and I's wedding text. Um, this might be a funny place to go, but my wife and I both had relationships before we met each other that just didn't go well. And uh, I dated uh, someone for two and a half years and that all fell apart. 
And I was kind of afraid of commitment for a while. Like, if that can just go wrong, then, then how do I know that if we say I do at the altar of a wedding, that we're going to be there for each other? I was kind of afraid of that. And Michelle had had some friends that really left her high and dry when she needed some help and support, and she, she was very hurt. And she had that fear too. And so we both kind of went into our lives together carrying um, this bit of fear. And so we chose 1 John 4, 16 and 8 through 18 as our wedding passage. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And in this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. For one who fears is not made perfect in love. Love driving out fear is just kind of one of those themes that we asked our pastor to talk about to us a lot. And it was was helpful. And so I, I imagine myself in those kind of terrifying moments looking at this future, being pretty confident that we are gonna have a great future ahead of us but knowing that we're just carrying those fears with us, we're going to need to deal with those honestly and clearly with each other. A, a few years back, um, I was counseling a, a marriage, a couple in marriage that was going terribly bad. And um, they'd separated. They were living in different homes, and, and they were meeting with me and the two of them, and we were trying to work out you know, and negotiate little ways that they could... Um, settle some of their, their deep hurt that they'd done to each other and work on that and, and name those things and forgive and bring these things before God. And, and I found myself kind of retreating from all of that. I was getting the cold shoulder from both of them, and I, I kind of thought, well, fine, if, if, if you're not going to be invested in this, I can't help you. And then I went on a service project um, in Massachusetts, and on this service project, God spoke to my heart and saying, you know what, remember Jesus went after lost sheep. And I was just convicted that I had used my fears to, to excuse my just kind of distancing myself from the couple because I was afraid there was nothing I could do to help them. I was afraid if I said what I really needed to say that they would just be angry at me and, and, and not, uh, not have any chance of this working out. And I I recognized in that moment there were some fears in me that were, were driving me to do the things that were not conducive of what I needed to do. I needed to speak clearly and truthfully to this marriage, and a fear had prevented me. And so when I think of fears, I, I can't think of snakes and bats and pandemics and economy. I just Those things don't often bother me, but I think about the things that do. And those are the things that I need to bring before the Lord. And whatever fears you have, would have listed are the things that you bring before the Lord. And I think Psalm 55 is a great passage to help us do just that. It names and describes so many things that we tend to be afraid of in life. Let's tease apart a little bit about our fears. We have types of fears on our, um, on our sermon outline, types of fears. Some of these are pretty mild. Precautions are, are a fear. Um, if you say, I, I'm not going to walk in the edge of that cliff because I don't want to fall down, I would be afraid of falling. That's a healthy precaution that makes you not flirt with disaster or take undue risks, and that's, that's good. That's kind of a caution that we have. God has given us that faculty to avoid things like that. And so that's not really what we're talking about. We are talking about particular fears. Fears that well up in us because, because a friend betrayed us. And now we're afraid, and this question is haunting us, who can we trust? We have particular fears of of, of enemies, people that are setting themselves up against us that have never been our friend, but they seem to have the means of, of harming us and ruining our lives. We're afraid of them, what they can do, what they get the power and the ability to do. We, we become afraid of, of when we share 
um, things that are in our hearts, deep in our hearts with a trusted friend, and then we recognize and we, we have reason to believe that friend is not very trustworthy anymore, and they have a piece of, of something that's kind of confidential. We're afraid they're just going to go and use that bit of dirt on us against us. That's a particular fear. And it has to do with our social fabric and our relationships and our life. And these are the kinds of things we bring before our God. Some of us have phobias. Um, I, I love the uh, Charlie Brown cartoon where Lucy is just listing off all these phobias that Charlie Brown has given her a nickel to diagnose his fears. And she finally says, you have a fear of everything. And he's like, that's it. Um, pho- phobias are these, are these fears that get triggered in us. And and, and it could be pretty innocent, but it could be things that really, really kind of keep us from living. Um, people have phobias of, of various things like heights and crowds and, and things like that. And, and those are often triggered because we had some experiences, some traumatic experiences with heights or crowds. Or maybe it's just kind of built into us and it's something that we need to avoid. Usually phobias do not get in our way and prevent us from doing what God has called us to do. But we can have something that means fear is just kind of ruling our whole life. And that's called paranoia. You're just kind of afraid of everything. You're afraid of life. You're afraid of getting up out of bed in the morning. You're afraid to go to work or go to school. You don't even know where it is or what is threatening you. You just think that everything's set against you in life. And I think David in this psalm, Psalm 55, is is naming some particular fears, but borderline on this paranoia that everything around him seems to be going terrible. Everything around him seems to be aimed at him of bringing him down. And he needs to bring these things before God in prayer. Usually what happens when we are afraid is we fight or we flee. And we see this, right? We see David wanting to flee. Verse 6. After he names these challenging situations, verse 6, he says, Oh, I had wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. He would get away from all these things that are threatening him. And isn't that our just kind of innate sense and desire? Let me just get away from this stuff. Let me fly away. Let me get out of here. Or we want to fight. We want to fight. Verse 15, let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the grave for evil finds lodging among them. We want to destroy our enemies. We want to see our enemies destroy each other themselves by what they are doing. And so there's some of this fight, there's some of this flight in this psalm, but what the important thing is, is the third option is praying. We fight or we fly, flee or we pray. We bring these things to God and we let God deal with the things that are threatening to us. We trust that God's going to act on our behalf and do the things that we can't do by ourselves. David starts when he says, I, he starts with his flight, oh, that I had wings, you know, I could leave this place, verse 6. But then, but then look down farther when he calls, but I call to God in verse 16, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, look at that. It's like, it's like he's had sleepless nights. He's worried about this, that he prays in the evening, then he prays in the morning, then he prays at noon. He's crying out in distress, but he is confident that God hears his voice. It's the Lord that's going to give him refuge from these fears. It's the Lord that's going to give him some, the gift of some distance from that which is threatening him. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me. When he's fleeing or he's fighting, God's going to be part of this. God's going to fight for him, and God's going to help him 
put those things in that gives him some distance from his fears so he will not sin, he will not fight out of the sense of fear that he's not just going to react and do things he's going to regret. David's trusting God is going to be involved in a way that can take even his fears and do something good out of them. Men who never change their ways have no fear of God. And here's the other key in this passage. When we are afraid of other things, sometimes it means that we don't have enough fear of God. And what that means is when we have a certain reverence and a certain awe and a certain bigness of the things that are afraid of us, sometimes our view of God has gotten small and shrunk down. We battle the fears of the world with our fear of God, our reverence and awe of God, how big and awesome and powerful and strong our God is in the midst and the light of our fears. And so based on God's word, I want to I say to each of you, when you're praying, your prayer is not hitting the ceiling. When you're praying your fears, God is hearing them. He's there and he's responding. And, and kind of like your pastor doesn't always experience the same fears you do, but, but has a capacity to imagine myself in my fears, God is not afraid of anything. But he has the capacity to know that in Jesus Christ, Jesus faced fearful things when he was looking ahead at his crucifixion. He was praying and blood was pouring out of his sweat pores in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was terrified of what he had to do. God relates to us. He knows what our fears are like and he can listen to us. He can join us and know us and be our provider. He can fight for us. He can protect us. God's our refuge and our strength. So, David begins by thinking about fleeing, getting away from there. Then he calls upon God in trust. And then through his prayers, through his meditating on God in prayer, he can conclude at the end of this psalm, but as for me, I trust in you. Something about naming these fears before God is, is not only calling on him for help, but it's reminding us that he hears us and he helps us. Part of naming fears before God is, has a therapeutic dimension of, of when you name your fears, they're not as powerful in your life. When you acknowledge them, they don't have this kind of hidden force in us. We place our fears before God. We cast our cares on the Lord, and then he sustains us. We describe them. And the power and the weight of them is diffused. And God hears us. And he helps us. David's situation is that he is dealing with anarchy, verses 9 through 11. There's a sense that there's chaos going on. People are wicked and they're plotting wicked things. There's violence and strife in the city. That's something I thought maybe would be brought up earlier. I'm kind of afraid because it seems like there's a, there's a spirit in the air of just retaliation all the time. When uh, people have valid grievances about how the world is, but then they go and just destroy things, making the world worse than it was, that's a reason a lot of people in our country are, are afraid. They're worried. What's, what's the future look? David is dealing with betrayal. That's something that um, I think most of us have experienced. Someone that was friend, someone that was close, someone that was trusted, throws us under the bus. We thought, I thought you were our friend. David's like, you know, if an enemy was saying things about me, that's fine. I could, I could endure that. If an enemy was calling me names, the enemy is accusing me, the enemy is taking the things I do and spinning them wrong, yeah, I could, I could endure that. But when it's someone that I used to just have the sweetest fellowship with, someone that was a deep friendship, when that person is taking my words and using them against me, when that person is taking the things that I confided in them with and 
and using them as arrows to shoot back at my heart. Yeah, that's betrayal. Jesus poured his life into 12 men. One of them sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knows what betrayal is, right? And then smooth talk. I think that's another thing that we're afraid of. We don't like our politicians waxing smoothly with their words when we think they've got all kinds of ill motives right underneath them. When someone's speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. Words that seem like soothing oil are really drawn swords. These are the three situations that I highlighted in David's situation. I think are true today too. There's a sense of kind of civil unrest, anarchy. There are people betraying each other, throwing each other under the bus. If you don't join my side or, or use my script to describe reality, um, we're going to betray you. We're going to cancel you. And then there's a smooth talk going on. Everything will be just fine if the right person's in charge. The media are part of the system in all of this. That's David's situation. That's our situation. Those are the things that we bring before God. We bring them before the God who hears and the God who rescues. We bring them before the God who sustains and the God who will win in the end. So, what do we do with our fears? We, we join David in praying this prayer in verses 16 through 19. But we call to God, and the Lord saves us. Evening, morning, and noon, we cry out in distress. He hears each one of our voices. He ransoms us unharmed from the battle waged against us, even though many oppose us. God, who's enthroned forever, will hear us and, aff and afflict them, men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. People think, people say that Christians are the enemies today of, of civil society. People are, are saying all kinds of evil against us, ungrounded. When they do say things against us that are deserved, then we repent. We say, yeah, you're right, I was wrong. But when, it's, but when it's a battle against us, when it's a battle against God's church, against God's values, against life, against liberty, against freedom of, of religion and freedom to debate and talk openly about matters, when that's what people are attacking, we come before God. We pray that he will rescue us. He will hear us. And of course, we conclude this psalm with the God who sustains and the God who wins in the end. Cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. We can say together, I think, tonight, as for us, we trust in you, our Lord and our God. So as we pray our fears, we name them clearly. We bring them in before God's presence. Say, God, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm afraid of. This is what's bothering me. This is my situation. And you let God speak back to you through his word. And you remember that he is hearing you. He will rescue you. He will sustain you. And he will win in the end. So we do not have to be afraid. Let's pray together. Lord God, your word is full of this command, do not be afraid. And yet so often we find ourselves trembling in our shoes, wondering what's going on in this world, wondering um, what kind of creatures are going to threaten us, wondering what kind of world this is turning into, wondering what kind of economy we are looking at in the near future, wondering what the world will be like for the next generation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would take our fears to you and that you would do something constructive with them and don't let them 
our fears just reside in us because we often do things destructive with our fears. We pray that, Lord, you would use them to remind us of your power, that you would act, that you would show up and make yourself known, and that we would continue to be confident in you, our Lord, the one who hears us, the one who understands us, the one who rescues us, the one who sustains us even in our trouble. And we are confident, Lord, that you will win in the end. Thank you for your promises and thank you for hearing us. Even when our fears are irrational, even when we are stuck and our faith is small, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for bringing us from fear to faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a familiar tune and I think some new words. Give to the winds your fears. We're going to stand and and sing through. It's uh, 438 in the red hymnals. Let's stand and sing all the verses of Give to the winds your fears. Go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And God's people said, Amen.